The formation of Rudel can be traced back to 2007 and the creation of the new iPhone. In this interview, we will discuss with Igor how he, along with a group of friends, were inspired to form Rudel as a reaction to not being able to read a book on the first edition of the now iconic smartphone. It would eventually lead to Riedel developing a document file reader and becoming one of the first 500 developers to appear on the App Store in 2008. Riedel has grown to become a long-lasting company that helps hundreds of millions of people to be more productive. My name is Aurel Redaway, and this is A Moment With. Hi, Igor. Good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time Thanks to talk me. to us today. Let's get right to it. What do you see as your motivation, your day-to-day -day philosophy? I'm a builder, so I like to take a rough idea and make it into something tangible. And is that something that started in childhood or...? I think so. So from playing chess, uh, playing with computers, doing uh, different math puzzles, I always love to connect the dots between different complex uh, concepts. <laughs> and what's your favorite thing you've built so far? That would be a team. We had uh, built more than 300 talented people across the globe that create amazing products. Fantastic. Let's chat further about that. So building on our conversation outside, we've got you here in London today. I'd love to hear more about Riedel and what you're all about. You started in 2007 and you were one of the first 500 apps on the App Store. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, when Apple announced iPhone in 2007, we got our hands to the device quite early. We saw that the hardware is remarkable and breakthrough. The software was not there. And in particular, you would not be able to read a book or a document on the iPhone comfortably. So we decided to fix that, hence the name of the company, Riedel, and we launched that in 2007. In 2008, next year, Apple launched the Apple App Store, and we had uh, been selected as uh, one of 100 or so developers on the planet who had their products on day one of Apple App Store. So how would you define the main motivation in starting Riedel? I think it's just this kind of urge when you see a problem and you believe that you can build a solution, that was really important. So we didn't think much about how big the business we want to, be, uh, to build or how sizable the company can get. It was really just seeing that gap and feeling, oh, I think we can actually fill this gap. We can build something meaningful for people and probably and hopefully we can do it better than others. You launched 40 products, is that right? Yes. And how many are still accessible? So we, la we launched in total 40 products throughout the uh, company lifespan, and right now we only actively sell five. So you could sell our success rate is uh, slightly above 10% so far. So if there's a mistake or an uh, issue or gap, we probably have done it. And that's okay as long as you learn. Mm. So I th I'm a huge fan of actually doing something, learning from it, and maybe reversing the course if needed than just being stuck into trying to figure out what's going to be the best outcome A, B and C and not moving. Well, I, I wouldn't say 16 million monthly downloads is a, a mistake. It's really amazing to see how you've grown. You feel like you've learned from mistakes. Could you give any examples of that? Some of the products we've launched, like PDF Office in 2014, they were too early with their business model. So we launched it with a subscription model before Adobe or Apple did this. So what has happened, basically, the market says, no, we are not renting software, we are not going to pay subscription, no way. And despite the product was really good, the market wasn't in a position to, to take it. Now, should we have launched this three years later, it would be totally appropriate, totally successful products, but we had to shut that down. You can't predict things like that, though. You have to take takes uh, risks, and sometimes uh, it's, it's a failure. And how do you react when those failures do happen? It is painful. It's always painful because uh, for each something we ship, there is a lot of effort for lots of people who are genuinely trying to do their best. And uh, it never is easier. But uh, through time, you just build kind of, you know, a thick skin and resilience to go through it. And every time we make a mistake, my focus is how do we get quicker to the outcome which justifies us actually taking a step back and doing this again. So how can we raise the bar saying, okay, yes, we had to park this uh, initiative or we had to redo this version, but, uh, but we really now have something which is fundamentally better and we are grateful for that. How do you think that impacts the team? What do you do when there are disagreements or arguments? Even? I love disagreements. If it's a disagreement around what is the best thing for us to do for a customer, or for the product, maybe for a team, that's the disagreement that has to be in place. 
So conflict is necessary, tension is important, as long as we are competent about it, and as long as we actually make the best decisions possible. So I love this personally. I believe that's the, the pinnacle, the core of uh, any company, any team that's striving to build something new. Spark was built from the ground up three times, right? What's your policy, what's your philosophy in terms of evolution? Simply speaking, we don't ship junk. And we really want kind of to, to, to build products which we would ourselves be using happily and be proud of. And therefore, with Spark, we tackled a very complex problem on how do you handle email for professional use cases. And uh, we had to build a lot of internal prototypes, sometimes rebuild it from scratch, to really get to the point when we're happy to roll it out to customers. And Apple is kind of shifting away from third-party apps and towards more in-house content. How's that going to affect Riddle? How do you see yourself reacting to that? We see the process when uh, many of our products are now part of Apple iOS. I know for sure that some of this actually was inspired by our products with Apple. However, for each customer, there's opportunity to take it to a next level. And we always strive in this kind of uh, last mile, like on the scenarios, last mile value that we can build. So therefore, for us, the opportunities were endless and they still remain to be endless. And what does the advent of AI mean in terms of your business model? Finally, I'm happy about it because finally AI and technology in general brings us to a point when a computer or software can figure out answers to questions that a human as a user should not really spend time on. And in that sense, I'm really a huge fan of uh, automation, AI, all assistance, and we really explore what we can do in our products on this one. Because it's something you've been using for a while, right? Of course. Before it was called machine learning, and before it was called linear algebra, but um, basically technology and knowledge behind it was, uh, was there for decades. I'd love to hear a bit about how tech impacted you growing up. Could you tell me about your first computer? Yes, it was a machine that uh, our parents actually borrowed money uh, to buy for me and my brother. And uh, it was a huge amount of money for us at the time. I think it was maybe several years of my dad's wages. And uh, they bought this computer in 1997. They brought it uh, in home and the very next morning they put it back to the shop because overnight I was trying to tweak it and it stopped uh, loading. So we had no clue how to fix it at the time, uh, but uh, it was a nice investment looking, looking backwards. Would you do a lot of that when you were growing up? Did you tinker with a lot of electric products? When I have time, I do. I like to see how things uh, work, whether it's people in a team, whether it's devices, whether it's business models. So that really drives me personally. Do you think that hands-on approach has an effect on your attitude as a CEO? I believe that the passion is important right now. In the, in the world of pragmatism, we really, we really stick to numbers and, and metrics and all the stuff. But I really um, like products and teams and outcomes that are making people smile, that are making people angry, that are making people engaged and, uh, and respond. So every time some of our customers actually email us saying, hey, you got a problem, I personally am happy to say thank you because there are hundreds of people who had the same issue and didn't have a chance to write it, uh, write it up for us. Now we know, now we can take it as a learning, now we can actually make things better. You must have to be very constantly aware and tuned in uh, as a CEO, it's a mindset. How do you switch off? I'm trying to do different things that are not uh, work-related. So I spend some time with photography, I do a little bit of defensive driving, which is my way to meditate. Uh, doing what, what is, what's defensive driving? <laughs> Technically, you're gonna, you go sideways in the car in a closed circuit, maybe at 50 miles per hour or 70 miles per hour. You have to be concentrated, you have to be relaxed, you have to do things fast, but you also have to think uh, through what's going on. And uh, that intensity actually is what pushes me out of day-to-day -day work and, and really kind of makes me uh, shift my mindset and shift my gears uh, in a way to really be able to, to reconnect next morning with the team and, and get going. And is there any advice you'd give to someone just starting out? I think the main one would be just go and do it. Go and do it when you don't have enough information or confidence or resources or backing up. Because that moment when you have all of this will never come. And therefore, it's just the habit to get okay with pressure, okay with uncertainty, okay with the risk that the whole thing is not a fail. You should ask yourself, would you regret not trying? And if the answer is yes, then that's, that's call to action. So 
building on that, what do you see as your kind of five year business model? We want to scale up further. So right now we have maybe 16 million people who use our product monthly. And uh, we really strive to build uh, great products so that 100 million people or more will be happy using them on a daily basis. I hope that in five years you'll have a next level of autonomy, relevancy and competency of digital assistance for everyone. Well, this has been such an interesting chat. I feel like we could sit and talk all day, but we've got to let you go. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks for having me.